This is episode 228 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I'm interviewing Sage Dahmers of Addictive Wellness. He mixes adaptogenic herbs with chocolate, and not only any chocolate, but raw mycotoxin-tested chocolate. And he has all of these different formulas, recharge, tranquility, immunity, energy, focus, and each one is geared towards a certain goal, and so it contains herbs that help towards that goal. I'm a huge fan of tonic herbs. I've been consuming them for over 10 years now, and what better way to take them than with chocolate? So in this interview, Sage talks about the different classes of herbs, the concept of three treasures, the effects of different herbs such as astragalus, cordyceps, and reishi mushroom, the difference between chocolate and coffee. Then I ask him listener questions, including what are the best herbs for strength, the best herbs for restorative sleep? Is there a concern with eating chocolate before bed? Can chocolate potentiate or diminish the effects of certain herbs? What are good herbs to take for a healthy pregnancy, for painful periods, what are the best herbs for the liver, and much more. So enjoy the show. Here is Sage Dahmers. All right, we are here with Sage Dahmers. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Matt. It's an honor. Good to see you. Yeah, it's been uh, several years. We were just talking about uh, the last time we saw each other. I don't know, eight years ago or something crazy pre uh, pre COVID. So, <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a different time, a different world. But uh, you know, no complaints. Things are all pretty good now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've been loving your chocolate. I, uh, I I think I've seen it at different stores over the years. But when I moved up to Idaho, you know, there's not that big of a health market, and so um, I just wasn't taking it. Then I moved down here and started seeing it again. I'm like, Oh, I should start taking that. So I just ordered in bulk online. And I was telling you uh, how much I've been loving the recharge one with uh, Yacomia, Sustanch and Romania. And uh, I've been taking herbs for, I don't know, 13 years, but it was never consistent. And I'm finding when I take them daily, it's a totally different world. Um, to just taking them for a couple of weeks and then taking several months off and then doing that again. Um, that's not really effective, is it? Right. Absolutely. And, and, and just quickly before we jump into that, yeah, we don't have many retailers in Idaho. I think we have one. Uh, shout out to, to Glow Juice Bar in Sun Valley, Idaho. <laughs> but uh, yeah, with these herbs, they are different than the, the traditional herbs that many people are familiar with. You know, people think about herbs like echinacea or, or milk thistle, some of these herbs with some history of use in Europe that in many ways are certainly better than their pharmaceutical alternatives, but they're not the ultimate. And what I mean by that is in the Taoist system, going back, you had different classes of herbs. You had one class that was considered poisons and you save these for people that you don't like. And then you had another class that was the medicinal herbs. And these are herbs like echinacea, for example, that you take for a short to moderate period of time to solve some sort of problem that's going on with your health. But you don't take them long term because there's some compounds in them that can have negative effects and, and cause some side effects, perhaps long term. But then you have this ultimate class of tonic herbs. And these are the kinds of herbs we use in our products. And these are meant to be taken in small amounts over the course of one's lifetime. And while you may feel some immediate benefits from them, and that can be a lot of fun, the real goal is to build this foundation of radiant life force and this um, just unassailable level of health that can be the foundation on which you build an extraordinary life. I love it. Well, uh, before we start jumping into to all the fun stuff, uh, and, and this will be fun too, <laughs> how did you uh, uh, get into this uh, whole whole? you know, topic of, of tonic herbs. I, I, it goes back to how I grew up, really. I grew up as a vegetarian, no, not, not a healthy one by any means, but my parents were doing the best that they, they knew how to with the knowledge that was available. And this was, you know, going back kind of pre-internet. So it, it, we didn't have access to the kind of information that we do today. So they were raising us on mostly organic foods, which is pretty cool. But it was 
it boiled down basically to basmati rice and tofu five nights a week. So not a whole lot of variety. And then night six and seven would be maybe uh, one night of pizza and one night of pasta. And that was about it. So that was how I grew up. And I always had this feeling that there was some potential within me that I wasn't tapping into. There, there was, I was missing some inputs perhaps, or just, I, and it, it came through a lot of playing sports. Like I was pretty athletic to a certain level, but there was always a higher level that I could never quite seem to be competitive in. And I didn't know what it was about. And I just kind of accepted that as life. But then as I got into my, my late teens, my parents had a, a wellness center in, in Thousand Oaks, California. And so it's, first of all, just amazing to grow up around that community and start seeing these people who would come in there, you know, in their 50s, 60s and have back pain and they would come to lay down on the on the infrared jade massage beds or use the infrared saunas. Um, and, you know, people had all these issues and they were getting dramatic improvements. And I got interested in thinking about this, you know, Eastern way of thinking in terms of prevention rather than having to deal with stuff after it goes wrong. Because these people, okay, they wait till they're 60, they feel crappy for 10 years, they find something to, to help them and then they're back to like a decent way of living. But I thought to myself, well, I don't have any other problems that these people have. What if I start to get into doing some of these things now when my health is pretty good? What could that mean in terms of how I can extend my life and the number of just cool experiences I can pack into my life before I have to eventually one day start slowing down? And then a, a guy from the community brought in some superfoods that he he produced and, and was going to sell there. And I got pretty interested because this guy had this mix. It was like a hemp protein, spirulina, chlorella, a few other, you know, Western herbs like, you know, milk thistle, for example. And he was looking super youthful, even though he was in his 40s. He was ripped and was super intelligent. And I was like, these are three things I would kind of like for myself as an 18 year old. And so I said, OK, whatever this guy's on, I'm going to do this. He says he drinks this mix twice a day and that's two of his meals a day. I'm going to do that. And I started drinking this. I didn't know what I was doing. I was blending this with like some frozen fruit, I mean, like, a, you know, strawberries, blueberries, banana, and some Tropicana orange juice. I had no clue. And it tasted like dirt. <laughs> but I didn't care. I was in it for the benefits. I was going to really push through the flavor and experience what was to be had there. And after a little while, I started noticing I would feel this extraordinary high feeling. And it wasn't a high of like a, a, a cannabis high where, where you're up in the clouds. This is high on a very clear day. And, and so I was like, wow, if this has been an option of a way of living for me all along, and I didn't know about it, what else have I been missing out on? There's a whole new world here. And so I you know, got into researching and learning more about nutrition, superfoods, and, um, and uh, eventually a little bit later, it led into some traditional herbal systems of indigenous cultures. And the more I would learn, the more I would incorporate into my life. The more I would incorporate into my life, the better I would feel. And I would start seeing it, whether it was mental performance or physical performance, physical endurance, how long I could stay out surfing. Um, I was noticing everything getting better. The better I would you know, perform in these areas, the more excited I would get to go learn more. So it was just this really great cycle that has basically never stopped to this day. And to, in terms of getting into the, the tonic herbs, um, I, I started getting exposed to a few here and there. Um, I think the first I ever tried was Makuna because, you know, I, I was a college kid. I had read a couple things here and there about uh, Makuna uh, for, for its sexual health benefits. And I was like, you know, not much was really happening for me, but I was thinking if something happens, I'm going to be ready. Uh, and And so I was just taking that every single day and thinking, you know, I'll, I'll be ready for whatever life throws at me. And then it expanded a bit from that. And then I started learning about astragalus. I remember you and I uh, back in the day would both attend the, the longevity conference events. And it was so wild for me because we would go to these conferences. And in my own life, I didn't have a lot of people around me who were into health and nutrition, especially people around my age or even ever a reasonably young age. And there would be these events twice a year where we would be around a couple thousand people who were just as passionate about this as we are. And it felt like our tribe. And these events would go from early in the morning to late at night. And even though I was super healthy, I, you know, I didn't have a, as much energy as I wanted to, to, to stay up and always have a good time 
and maximize this weekend with all these like-minded people. And so I learned about a stragglist in terms of its ability to improve one's natural energy production. Not as a stimulant, it's not like a coffee type thing, but just improving the body's own way of making energy. And so I started taking this and I wouldn't even mix it in a smoothie. I was just doing straight spoonfuls into my mouth. And I would do this all weekend of these events and I would just be flying high, having an amazing time. And little by little, you, you kind of learn about another herb, you learn about another herb and you keep expanding your repertoire. And there's so many that I'm sure we'll talk about a bunch of different ones. I just want to say up front for people, you'll hear about a lot and you'll think, oh, geez, where do I start? Like this seems kind of daunting. Just pick one, just pick one and pick the one that sounds the most interesting or exciting to you or the one that, that the name sounds cool, whatever. Get onto one, let that start shifting things in your life. And then, you know, maybe later you add another one. That's a great strategy. And what do you think about picking one based on maybe what issue you're having? Like if you're having energy issues, maybe astragalus and cordyceps, or if you're feeling stressed, reishi, um, or, you know, depressed, macuna or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you'll, you'll hear about benefits of different tonic herbs and, and you basically pick the one that is most suited to you, the one that you hear about maybe something like cordyceps and its ability to improve oxygen utilization. And so increasing both physical and mental energy, endurance and focus. And maybe that's just, you know, sets off a light bulb in your head. Like, yeah, that sounds awesome. I want some of that. So you start with that one. Absolutely. Yeah. Start with, start with what is going to be most suited to you. So I could probably pick one herb and say, if I was to try to give everybody one thing, you would start on this, but everybody's different. Everybody's at a different stage of their health, different stage of their life, have a different, you know, backstory and all that. So the perfect first herb is going to be a little different for each person. Well, we, let's do a little, uh, little experiment. So let's say uh, someone recently stopped drinking coffee and uh, was kind of relying on that every day as like, you know, the mental boost or for creativity or productivity or whatever. And they quit coffee and maybe they just feel like depleted. Um, what would be like an herbal protocol that you would put together for someone like that? Well, if we just wanted to keep it real simple for somebody who's new to this and start with one herb rather than telling them you got to get this, 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 and this. And, and we could go that way as well. And we can, we can explore more of a formulation after. But for one herb, I would say start with cordyceps. So this is a fungi uh, which has the ability to improve your oxygen utilization, as we mentioned a moment ago. So from the air you breathe, more oxygen is actually making it into your blood, into your muscles, into your brain. And it's also helping to fuel ATP production. ATP is your pure cellular energy. And it contains a, actually a compound in it called cordycepin, which is very similar, like remarkably similar in its structure to ATP, which is the fuel that keeps every single cell in your body going. If you had no ATP for even, I, I can't remember the amount of time, it's like a, a number of seconds. If you stopped having ATP, you, you would be dead. Um, so, I would say cordyceps for that reason, because it's helping you make more energy in a sustainable way, not just stimulating you to use it from your reserves, but also cordyceps is what in the Taoist system would be called a jing tonic. This is an herb that builds your core kidney adrenal reserve energy. And this is something that you think of as your savings account of energy. And when you have caffeine, it's not really helping you to uh, produce more energy. It's helping you to withdraw more energy from your reserves as an adrenal stimulant. So think of it, you have this savings account, you can call it your Jing, that you in the beginning of your life inherit from your parents. And it depends on how healthy your ancestors were, how they ate, how they lived. Some people start with more, some people start with less. At that point, it's like a trust fund. Some people come into life with a fat trust fund. Some people don't get anything. And that's just luck of the draw. That's how it goes. And these people, for example, the ones who come in with the big trust fund, they're the ones who can totally abuse their bodies, not really show signs of that abuse. You know, they're, they're drinking, they're partying. They make fun of people like you and I who are actively working on our health because uh, sometimes they, you know, on a surface level can initially seem to be just as healthy as us, even though they're putting zero effort into it and actually doing everything they can to mess themselves up. That only works until a certain stage. Eventually you deplete your trust fund and then you die. But some people start out with a bunch, some people not so much. And then you use this as you go through your life. The more you stress, the more you don't sleep well, the more you eat a poor diet, the more you use stimulants, you deplete this at an accelerated rate. There are certain 
herbs, certain foods, certain yoga practices that can be done to help build up these reserves. So at this point, it's like your savings account. You only withdraw from it when you choose to or when you fall into stress or when, you, when you're taking stimulants. And so caffeine is basically saying, well, I don't know what, what's going on in your, in your checking account right now, but we're just gonna take some out of your savings to make sure you get through this day and, and are feeling pretty good. So cordyceps is helping to replenish those reserves. So not only is it giving you a more sustainable way to produce your daily energy, but it's also building up the reserves that you may have depleted over the years by becoming excessively reliant on coffee. Now I'm not maligning coffee entirely, you know, having a, a couple of cups each day for the right person whose genetics agree with it. Um, and Because what's great for one person can be kryptonite for another. Coffee is kryptonite for me, maybe not for another person. But for the right person, it can, it can bring a lot of benefits in moderation at the right stage of their health journey. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that point at the end for sure. I agree. So what you were uh, referring to, uh, I believe, is the three treasures. Like you mentioned, Jing being the savings account. There's also uh, Qi and Shen. Is Qi like our checking account? Exactly. You're one step ahead. That's perfect. So, so I, I expand this financial metaphor to talk about the three treasures because in the Taoist system, they didn't have, you know, in, in the old days, they didn't have our modern financial system. So they use the, the metaphor of a candle. So they said the Jing is the wax and the wick of the candle. The Qi is the flame, the active part of the candle. And then the Shen is the light given off by the candle. But the way we can look at these in, in terms that are maybe more easy to, for people to relate as they think about their money is that the Jing is your savings account. Then your Qi is your checking account. It's where you're doing your daily withdrawals and deposits. So you, you are hopefully living just out of your checking account and not dipping into your savings in the ideal world. So if you're generating enough energy, you're generating more into your checking account each day than you're expending. If it's the other way around, you're dipping into your savings, you're depleting your jing, theoretically shortening your life experience and wearing yourself down prematurely. Then the ultimate purpose of a candle, as I said, is not just to have a big flame, but to give off a big light. The ultimate purpose of making money shouldn't just be to have a mega checking account. It should be to have a beneficial effect on the world around you. So this is where we get into having a nonprofit or a charity. And so that's what your Shen is. Your Shen is your higher self, your spirit, the light in your eyes, and overall your ability to have a beneficial effect on those around you. And so you can't have a really great charity that you fund if, you, if your personal finances are to in total disarray. So it starts by building that foundation. Uh, to go to the candle metaphor, you're not gonna give off a ton of light if you're just a little birthday candle. So you start, building the Jing, building that deep core foundation in those reserves. Then you start looking at building the Qi. And you could take a herb like cordyceps that would effectively work on both of those at the same time. And then, and the result in the end is Shen. And there's herbs like Reishi and Pearl Powder and Albizia that can really help to magnify that as well. That's awesome. And then you referred to uh, your core kidney energy and I think in the, the Chinese system, you often hear of, um, is, do they refer to the organs being either hot or cold? That's something entirely different from what we've been talking about, right? So uh, within each organ, you have the, the, the yin and the yang. And this is an, another element of Taoist philosophy that essentially exists in all aspects of life, right? You have the yin and yang of the seasons. You have the yin and yang of day and night. You have the, the yin and yang of the organs themselves and the organ systems. And when we talk about these organ systems, like when we talk about the kidneys, this doesn't just include the actual organ as we would think of it in modern times, the, the kidneys that, that you know process your urine. This includes other things. It, it's the kidneys, it's the adrenals, it actually includes also the muscles in your body and your skeletal system and, and to some degree your brain. So there's, uh, it, it can be a little bit misleading when you hear these, these Taoist organ system or Chinese organ system names uh, because they they go beyond just the individual organ that is mentioned in the translation. Interesting. Yeah, it's been really fun to dive into this. And I ordered uh, a few books to uh, to to start to learn about it because um, I've just like dabbled over the years. Um, so I ordered like Ancient Herbs uh, and Modern Medicine by uh, Han Henry and then Principles of Traditional Chinese Medicine. Um, 
Were there references that you used to learn about this stuff? Yeah, so uh, th- th- there was a number of different books that that I came across along the way that were very helpful. Um, of course, the one that first got me the most excited was The Ancient Wisdom of the Chinese Herbs by Ron Teagard, which is, I think, a great starting point for lots of people to to get into this whole herbal philosophy of tonic herbalism and also learn about some of the great super tonic herbs. And this, I remember the first time I read it, I read it through once and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I need all this knowledge, not just in a book on my bookshelf. I need this all to be in my head. And I just read it over and over and over and over. And the philosophy and the wisdom that's in that book is just so incredible. So for the average person, I would say that's the most amazing starting point if they want to, after listening to this episode, to expand their knowledge further in this in this regard. But there's also um, the the Ted Kapchuk book, the, the web that has no weaver, um, which is another great, uh, slightly more advanced book delving into Chinese and, and Taoist herbal philosophy. Awesome. I'm definitely going to check those out. So so when did you decide or, or why did you decide to start mixing these herbs with cacao? So uh, it, it kind of started in my late teens, not that long after I started really making progress along this path of health. Because, you know, I would make those those not so great tasting smoothies I was telling you about earlier, but I would feel amazing for them. And When you start to get into health, the natural thing, when something is really having a beneficial effect on your life, the next thing you want to do is share it with your friends and your family because you want to have the maximum positive impact on others around you and and be on the same fun journey with them. So I was in college at the time, and you can imagine trying to get college friends who are just drinking and partying and, and, you know, taking prescription painkillers onto this, not the easiest thing. So I was very careful about pushing it onto anybody not wanting to like be the 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 buzzkill so to speak and so i didn't say much about it but then i was on a surf trip with my friends in costa rica and we would go out and surf the waves were amazing i they would come in after two or three hours they were tired they you know, had to rest wanted to eat and i would just be out there i wasn't hungry i had plenty of energy i just kept surfing and surfing and surfing and they would see me in the corner of the hostel not really saying anything just with my Nutribullet blending these little drinks for myself before we would go out surfing. And they were kind of noticing, not saying much about it. And eventually a few of them said, hey, can you maybe like make me one of those? And as you can imagine, this is the moment I had been waiting for. I was like, yes, absolutely. I thought you'd never ask. And so I did. But the first of all, the flavor was rough. So that was really difficult for them because most people, um, unless it tastes good, they're not going to consume it. And they were also had such high levels of toxicity from just the overall college experience that sometimes when you take detoxifying compounds into your body and your toxic levels are so high, those toxins are going to be mobilized the fastest way out of the body possible. And sometimes that's back up to the top the way they originally came in. So three out of the four of them were immediately vomiting. And so I I realized a couple of things. First, you got to start people off gently and you got to meet them where they're at. Second is that if, you don't figure out a way to make this stuff taste good and win on flavor to the point where people are eating it because it tastes good and it just so happens to be good for them rather than it tastes bad and they're eating it because it's supposed to be good for them. You're never really going to have that much of a benefit for other people and never going to be able to, to share this with other people. And I, could, I, I knew that if I could figure out a way to share it with others, it would bring me a lot of joy in life to see. And around that same time, Also in Costa Rica, where I was spending a lot of time in those years of my life, I learned how to make chocolate. And I was learning more and more about how chocolate and cacao, if done right, if kept pure, can be one of the greatest superfoods in the world. And it had these, I was just blown away when I started to learn that it's the highest natural source of antioxidants in food. It's the highest natural source of magnesium in any food. It's great for chromium, for blood sugar balance, and it's got all these extraordinary compounds in it like phenethylamine, anandamide, serotonin that are optimizing your brain health and your overall happiness. Because at that time also, I wanted to share something with people that was going to help them have a better time. Because at that stage, everyone, like the, the only doorway to a good time for any of my friends was alcohol, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe a few other substances. But nothing that I was into. And so I wanted to find something that was healthy, but also open to that gateway for people. And so 
I started getting into making chocolate and sharing it with friends. And then I, around this, you know, a little bit later, as I was learning about these traditional herbal systems, the, the big obstacle I was finding there is a lot of these herbs have some pretty bitter flavors. There's a few that are, are really user-friendly. For example, astragalus, which we briefly mentioned earlier, has a really light vanilla graham cracker flavor to it. But another one of my favorite ones, reishi mushroom, has very strong bitter flavors. And with reishi, the more bitter flavor it has, the stronger the reishi is. So I need to figure out a way to deliver these to people. And the great thing is that chocolate is also bitter. But for some reason, people have embraced that chocolate has some bitter flavor to it. I mean, you still have some holdouts that will only eat milk chocolate and they, they haven't embraced the, some of the bitter elements. But for the most part, people are okay with the bitter flavors of chocolate. And I figured out you can camouflage in a lot of these bitter herbal flavors underneath the chocolate. And for the most part, people will be none the wiser and they'll enjoy it thinking about it as a chocolate and they won't even realize the kind of medicine that you're sneaking into. That's awesome. Yeah, I think the, the first time it made raw chocolate was like 2011 and I mixed in Bacopa and it was several tablespoons. That just ruined the whole recipe. <laughs> right, There's you know, as you go along, you find there's certain herbs that are, are amenable to the flavor of chocolate and certain ones that will just overpower it. Bacopa is, is one of those that will overpower, you know, when we were formulating our focus chocolate, for example. The, the herbs in there are all very friendly. You know, you have like lion's mane, Siberian ginseng, uh, cordyceps, uh, ashwagandha. But there's ones that I wanted to put in there, like bacopa or like rhodiola, that are have interesting flavors in their own ways and, and can be combined with things that taste great, but they don't play well in the sandbox with chocolate. They, they insist on overpowering the whole flavor experience. So the amount of herbs in each uh, formula that, that you guys created, is it, a medicinal dose like how did you figure out how many milligrams of each to add yeah so it, um, in terms of the formulation that's in each one it's basically equivalent to taking several capsules of of herbal extracts so yeah it, it is designed to be a dose that people are really going to experience because i could hype up these chocolates and the herbs that are in them all day long and that will get people to try them and they'll order it once but if somebody doesn't have a meaningful experience with that chocolate they're not going to be back as a repeat customer. And as, as a business of consumable products, one-time customers uh, don't, don't make for a sustainable business model. So our business model relies on peeping, people, uh, people having a meaningful experience with the chocolate. So yeah, the, the, the dosages are, are uh, calculated to, to make people have an experience. Yeah, I, I think they all taste great. I feel all of them. Uh, yeah, recharge is my favorite. I think focus is is probably tied, and then I've been playing with uh, tranquility, which is good for uh, someone like myself that's taking a break from coffee, maybe indefinitely. Who knows? With the uh, the hoshu wu and hoshu wu is one of those strong herbs. I've taken that as a tincture, and it can be pretty intense. Yeah, hoshu wu is really one of the the greatest adrenal restorative herbs from this tonic system. It's it's called a yin jing restorative herb, and there's a legend about it that is about this guy. His name is Mr. Ho, and, and he lived thousands of years ago in China. And his life wasn't really going so great. He'd never had romantic success. Uh, he wasn't in great shape. He didn't have lots of energy. He had, you know, kind of general fatigue. He had lost most of his hair, wasn't looking too good. And things were just not going his way in life. And he had, basically, if we trace it back, he hadn't been born with a lot of jing. And one day he was, drinking a lot. And he fell asleep, drunk in the forest, passed out. And when he awoke, he noticed kind of in his drunken stupor, there were these herbaceous vines growing next to him. And the way these vines were intertwined in his state, he thought it looked kind of like a intertwined man and woman making love. And so he got inspired by this. Uh, and he dug up the roots of this plant, took it home, and boiled the roots in a black bean stew. And he ate this stew and he started feeling some very surprising vitality come back into his system. And so he went and found more of this and, and kept doing this and doing this. And he basically rebuilt his jing, rebuilt his, his savings account of energy and this foundation of his life. And there's various versions of the legend, but depending on which one you, you ascribe to, they say he, he lived to be about 130 and had 70 children. Now, 
It's a legend, probably dramatically over-exaggerated, but it gives you an idea of the restorative power uh, and the virility power of this herb. That's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that story. Uh, I think at one conference I had uh, Romani D. Thomas make me like an herbal formulation and it was a bean mixture. And uh, I'm starting to see beans and a lot of different herbal formulas, uh, especially like the dark, like black beans, like you mentioned. Right. Is is black associated with Jing? Or That's correct. Yeah. So in general, uh, black foods are considered Jing building foods. And that's why on our recharge chocolate, we made the label as it it's our black label chocolate uh, as, as a little reference to that. So with these foods, you think about things like black beans, as you mentioned, black sesame tahini is another one really delicious. Uh, so good to put on top of, of many different foods and a great Jing building substance. Um, you can look into the world of Ayurveda and look at something like Shilaji, Hoshu Wu, black food. And so as you find these different black foods, it kind of can set off this trigger in your brain of, okay, this is something that's going to be very vitality building. Now, there are certainly processed black burnt charred foods out there. Just burning your food does not make it a jing building substance. So don't go do that. <laughs> it's a good disclaimer. Because <laughs> <laughs> people will try all sorts of stuff, you know. <laughs> um, I love it. Well, Let's see. We we have a few questions. Do you want to get through these? Because we have quite sure. a few. I'm not sure how long it'll take. So yeah, I'm uh, curious. Awesome. Uh, so my friend John asks, what are the best herbs for strength building? Ah, so in terms of building strength, one uh, before we even talk about the herbs, I would say cacao is actually surprisingly effective. Uh, the the epicatechins that you find in cacao are actually shown in research to maximize the effects of strength building, or maybe maximize is not the best word. I would say it just increase. Um, yeah, maximize, I realize this, it makes it sound like it's the number one over anything else, but there's probably also things that are competitive with it. But also then I would think about, for example, um, cordyceps, which we mentioned earlier to do that one once more because of the way it's going to increase your strength and endurance. And there were stories back in the 80s of Chinese female athletes who were dramatically outperforming everybody else. And there may have been some steroids involved, but they couldn't find them. The only thing that they were able to figure out is that these women were taking cordyceps. So a lot was attributed to that. Not to say they didn't have some advanced steroid technology that, <laughs> that they couldn't test for yet, but that's how it was explained. And that tells you a lot about what cordyceps can do for performance increases. And it's something where if you are doing some form of exercise regularly, where it's, whether it's weightlifting, running, uh, some kind of intense yoga, if you take cordyceps for it, I've always found that people really notice a difference, especially when it's, if you do the same thing, so you have a bar to measure against. Like if you're doing different workouts every day, it's a little bit hard to compare, but if you have a similar yoga practice every day, or you run a similar length of distance, or you have a similar sort of strength training routine, and you can do with and without cordyceps, it's a really fascinating thing to compare and, and see how it's affecting you. But then also Siberian ginseng would be another great herb here, rhodiola, would be a fantastic one. And then you can approach things from the testosterone side as well. So in terms of building testosterone, ashwagandha is a great one. And there's been quite a bit of research on ashwagandha on not only building testosterone, but also increasing strength gains. So ashwagandha would be definitely a big one. Awesome. And then on the, the flip side, the recovery side, um, some people asked uh, herbs for restorative sleep um, and yeah, I guess we'll, we'll hit that one first, then I have another sleep question after that. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, so number one here, I would say reishi mushroom really improves the total duration of sleep when you look at the research done on it. Um, and, and it's just going to take down your stress so massively because everybody has such busy lives these days. No matter how much technology we get that's supposed to save you time and make your life easier, uh, it just seems to get more hectic. So you have to bring in some external things to help you find some inner peace and help you wind down. And, and, and reishi, you know, there's a saying about it that if you don't think reishi is a magic mushroom, you just haven't been taking it long enough because it's, you could say it's subtly psychoactive and, and takes its effects over a period of time. And it's, it's really something where it sounds silly if you haven't taken it and you hear somebody talking about it in this way, but when you've taken it for a good period of time, you understand what it's all about. And that's definitely up there is if I was to force feed everybody in the world one herb, that would probably be it. <laughs> now, 
Also for sleep, you can look at a formulation called ginseng and zizipus, um, sometimes also called codonopsis and zizipus. That's Z-I-Z-Y-P-H-U-S. Uh, and, and that's a traditional classic Chinese herbal formulation for assisting with sleep. And pearl powder is another really great one. To It's a, it's a shen tonic, so it's helping you feel more peaceful. Hoshu Wu that we mentioned earlier in that regard is really good. And if maybe this stuff is too exotic for you and you want something a little more familiar, kiwis, eating two kiwis just before going to bed is showing in research to have uh, great improvements on the quality of and duration of sleep and lead to fewer awakenings during the night. So there's, uh, you know, different ways to go about it. But I, I, I applaud this person for wanting to improve their sleep because there's pretty much no area of your life that is not going to be beneficially affected by improving the quality of your sleep. Absolutely. Um, and on, on sleep, what's the, uh, are there concerns with people eating chocolate before bed? And then kind of a two-parter, is there a best time to eat chocolate? Yeah, so in terms of chocolate before bed, it depends on your sensitivity to caffeine and, and what kind of caffeine metabolizer you are in a big way. So caffeine does have this effect where you have these things in your brain called adenosine receptors. And think of it as a game of musical chairs. You have these chairs, and as the day goes by, more adenosine molecules come and sit in these chairs. And this builds what's called sleep pressure. It helps you get tired and go to sleep. The thing with caffeine is caffeine molecules can occupy these musical chairs, leaving the adenosine with nowhere to sit. And it, uh, the caffeine has a pretty long half-life, uh, depending on the individual. Uh, for some people, they're fast caffeine metabolizers and they can get rid of it more quickly. Some people are slow and it hangs around longer. But as long as that caffeine is there in those seats, the adenosine can't get into them. That's why it's harder to fall asleep after you've had caffeine. So chocolate has a relatively small amount of caffeine. Like if you look at our cacao powder, for example, um, we've had that tested to have 13.5 milligrams of caffeine per, per one tablespoon serving. And so that's roughly in the, in the range of what you would look at for, a, say, a strong cup of decaf coffee, which is going to have somewhere between two and 15 milligrams. When you look at a full cup of coffee, of course, the varieties and everything, but on average, you may be looking at getting towards 100 milligrams. So it's a you know, tiny fraction of what you're looking at with coffee. But for the very sensitive person, you may want to stick to having it before 2 p.m. to be absolutely on the safe side and make sure it's not going to interrupt your ability to go to sleep. But for some people, having something like one of our Tranquility chocolates in the evening as kind of an after-dinner treat is definitely going to be better than pretty much any other dessert they could turn to. And that tiny amount of caffeine that would be in just one piece of chocolate that, you know, satisfies them and makes them feel good. Plus, it's got herbs in there that are going to help them wind down. I think for the right person, that can be a great thing to do as well. So you mentioned that uh, coffee for you is a, a kryptonite. Um, and I wasn't aware that uh, chocolate has a small amount of caffeine. So I knew about theobromine, which is kind of like a related molecule. It's a it's a less potent stimulant, right? So are you saying even though you're very sensitive to coffee, you do just fine with your chocolate. Yes, thank goodness. Because if I if I didn't, I got, you, you got to have something in life, right? If you take chocolate away from me too, geez, that would just not be fair. And so you have these different stimulants. You know, you have, for example, caffeine, which you find in in coffee and tea. You have matine, which you find in your mate. You have theobromine, which you find in chocolate. And theobromine is related to them. It is a stimulant to a degree, but it doesn't affect the nervous system in the same way as you get with caffeine. So it's much gentler. You know, people talk about getting a little stimulated from chocolate, but you never get a coffee level rush. Nobody's ever had, you know, coffee feelings from a bar of chocolate. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the body in the same way. So it's much gentler. And for it's, it's interesting because even though there is some in there, I do fine with it. And so there, there's a couple factors here, genetic factors for me. One is I have the COMT++ gene. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know whether you might have this as well. You, you seem like the type to have it. Do you? I do. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so what happens with this is that you don't produce uh, these catechol, excuse me, you, you don't produce uh, these methylation factors for catecholamines at the same rate as a normal person. What that means is, you make dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, just like a normal person, but you don't get rid of them at the same rate. 
So if you imagine if you continued producing, you know, filling up the trash can at the same rate in your house as you normally do, but you only took it out once, you know, every two weeks instead of every two days, well, now you're going to end up with a lot of trash around and it's going to be a real problem. So what happens when people like you and I consume caffeine is that it increases then our production of norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, and this makes us feel on top of the world. It really fires up the frontal lobes in your brain. So your ability to focus, your overall feelings of happiness, these are just through the roof. Um, and also your filter. So you're able to really be cognizant of what you do and don't say. For people like you and I, it's extraordinarily rare that you say, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Or oh, I, did I say that out loud? That doesn't happen to us. Uh, then, then, And that's just one of the great benefits. And, and so there's a lot of blessings with this, but it's a double-edged sword because on the other hand, if you're ha having something like a lot of caffeine coming into your body or even a moderate amount, you build up these catecholamines in the frontal lobes and they become irritants to your nervous system because you can't get rid of them fast enough. So what happens for me, and it's a little bit different for everybody because there's other genes that get involved in this as well. But for me, I will feel on top of the world the day of drinking coffee. But then for four or five days afterwards, I actually feel really sad. And to a degree, having more coffee will keep that at bay, but it catches up with you and it can be quite rough. And that's for me is compounded by the fact that I am a slow metabolizer of caffeine. So I'm also not able to get rid of the caffeine fast enough. And so it stays around lingering longer in my system. And it then continues producing these catecholamines and I can't get rid of the catecholamines. So it's, it's a, unfortunately, a combination that doesn't allow me to enjoy coffee, which would be lots of fun if I could. But, you know, I get to have an unlimited amount of healthy chocolate for the rest of my life. So I'll, I'll take what I can get. It's not too bad. <laughs> is, there, is there a time where you had maybe two or three of your chocolate bars at once? Like what was the max amount you've had at one, one sitting? I think the most I've ever done is a whole bar. Um, okay. You know, on, on, on an average day, I usually have, I would say one or two pieces, which is like, you know, up to half a bar. And that's what we put as the recommended serving size. But it's interesting because when, when we were doing like the labeling of, our chocolates and getting them reviewed for regulatory compliance. One of the things that was brought to our attention was that the FDA's official recommended serving size of chocolate is 50 grams. And one of our bars is 48 grams. But I didn't want to label it for that much because that's a lot of chocolate. Like it's what we found amongst our customers and people who have enjoyed our chocolate, very rare for somebody to have a whole bar. It happens sometimes, like plenty of food. Sometimes people eat twice the serving size, but on average, people are having two pieces. And I think that you know, it connects a lot to the nutritional density of, of what's in there that you don't need to have so much. You, you end up having large serving sizes when the density of nutrition in there is low. But when you have it packed with these micronutrients, you tend not to need as much. That's what I've noticed. Yeah, I've tried the whole bar and then I've tried, you know, usually two squares is perfect for me. Right. Nice. Yeah, that's good. No, that's a sweet spot for you as well. <laughs> um, let's see. Can chocolate potentiate or diminish the effects of certain herbs? Generally, it's going to potentiate because that's that was one of the things that inspired me as I was learning to combine these herbs with chocolate for two reasons. So cacao is a vasodilator. So th this is something you also get with caffeine, for example. But cacao in particular is a vasodilator, which is going to help drive these herbs deeper into your system and improve their absorption. Then on the other end, Cacao is also a mild MAO inhibitor, and it's a, a rare legal MAO inhibitor. It's, it's, there's a lot of MAO inhibitors that are not legal, but this is a, a one that is legal. And the way an MAO inhibitor works is these kind of herbal compounds, they come into your body and they're allowed to stay around for a certain amount of time. And then eventually the bouncer comes in and says, okay, club's closing down. We're done for the night. Time for you guys to go. Hope you had a good time. You know, appreciate you being here, but please, you know, get a cap. That's MAO. That's monoamine oxidase. It eventually, after things have been in your system for a while, it shows them the way out. Now, that's good if you have, in, in lots of ways, it's good. It helps to keep balance in your body. But if, let's say, you have some people that come to the club and they, at the end of the night, are super cool. They're helping you clean up. They're, you know, they're helping take care of the place. They're putting the chairs back. You're going to say, you know, the bouncer's going to come. You know what? These guys are cool. They can stay around. 
a little bit longer. Uh, you know, we appreciate what you guys are doing. And that's what cacao is it, with these herbal compounds that are coming in with it. It's telling your body, hey, these guys are cool. Don't need to kick them out right away. Let's let them stay here and keep having their beneficial effects for longer. That's a great analogy. That's really cool. No, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, kind of a technical one, potential issues with too much serotonin and ashwagandha in certain people. Is that another genetic thing? Um, could could be could also be related to somebody taking SSRIs, um, and and if you're taking SSRIs, then you have to be careful about how much serotonin you're stimulating yourself to produce. You know, the the extreme case example of that would be that it, it, as more and more research is being done on MDMA assisted psychotherapy, one of the which dramatically increases your serotonin levels, that. If somebody wants to do that for depression, that's one of the things that's being studied for is, you know, treatment resistant depression is that they have to come off of their SSRIs in order to be able to do it. So, so there, there, there are risks, certainly, um, if somebody is on pharmaceuticals that are affecting their ability to keep their neurotransmitters balanced, to, to not push things too much to an extreme. Awesome. Uh, are there herbs that are helpful for labor for women? Oh, we're talking about like giving birth, right? Not, not like physical labor. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very tricky question. And generally things had not been studied for this in the modern world, in the, in the herbal realm, because basically few to no women are going to say, do a study on me with something that's never been studied before while I'm pregnant and have a precious life coming out of my body. So, so while there is some traditional use of certain things during pregnancy. Like you can see some traditional use of astragalus and reishi, for example. Problem is that you don't have modern research to support this at this stage. So, you know, as a uh, thing to be air, really airy on a set of cautions, we prefer to say, just stick with what's proven, stick with what you can really trust. Um, and, and you're gonna have plenty of opportunities to enjoy the benefits of all these herbs after pregnancy and breastfeeding. But for now, yeah, you know, this is such a sensitive stage of life, such a precious thing going on that you really want to err on the side of caution. Um, someone asks, please discuss yakomia for increasing phytoandrogens in females. Yes. So eucomia uh, does have benefits and has been shown in animal research to be mildly androgenic and help with hormone optimization. So eucomia is, had, had you asked the previous question, meaning, physical labor rather than giving birth labor, I would have said eucomia and astragalus, but eucomia particularly because the biggest thing that it's known for is improving the strength and integrity of muscles and tendons and ligaments and bones. Um, so great in that regard as well, but also pretty good herb for, for supporting hormone optimization. Awesome. And then um, what about herbs for painful periods? So there, the first step would be to get a complete hormone panel done to get a better understanding of why are you having these painful periods? You know, it, it's going to be different. Let's say you're just super estrogen dominant versus maybe somebody has PCOS versus maybe somebody has endometriosis. There can be so many factors here. And working with a functional medicine doctor who specializes in hormone health to first of all, figure out what's going on and then plot you a path to happier hormones and, and happier reproductive health is going to be the way to go. Now, in general, you can look at herbs like white peony, uh, herbs like ashwagandha would be another example. Um, gelatinized maca, I think is worth mentioning. And there's an Ayurvedic herb called shatavari. And I would say those would probably be some of the top four. There's also a few formulations worth mentioning. So from the Chinese system, you have a formulation called bupleurum, which is B-U-P-L-E-U, wait, ah, B-U-P-L-E-U-R-E-M, uh, bupleurum and peony. Um, and then you also have uh, uh, Codenopsis and Longin is another great one. Um, and then just overall making sure that your, your uh, iron levels are really good, that you're not anemic, because this can, can play quite a big role as well. And this is both um, iron deficiency anemia to think about, and also um, how anemia can be affected by having B12 levels that are too low. So there can be a lot of contributing factors here. So you really want to get some blood work done to have a more complete picture of where you're at in all these regards to plot the path to hormonal wellness for you. Uh, question for me, are, are, are you a fan of, of people finding a good uh, 
TCM practitioner to put together like a custom herbal formula um, for someone? It can be good. You know, I when when it comes to practitioners, whether you're talking about an, an allopathic doctor or a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor or, or a TCM doctor, there are amazing ones out there, but it's definitely not the case that 100% of them are amazing. And it's not the case that 100% of their herb sources are amazing because in many cases like this, their their specialty is not procuring the purest, most potent herbs. It's getting them from some you know more generic source and then they're really good at formulating them. So it, it can be good and people certainly do see benefits from this. Um, a lot of TCM though is more medicinal herb focused rather than tonic herb, although they do have some knowledge in that area and incorporate some tonic herbs. A lot of TCM practitioners, their education is heavily, heavily focused on acupuncture with a supplement of herbal education. So the, like I said, there are some amazing ones out there, but it's you got to make sure that yours is amazing because that's, you know, it's like there's all, whether you're talking about practitioners or talking about foods, whether you're talking about herbs or cacao or whatever, there's all levels of quality out there. That's a great point. Yeah. I've only been up to San Francisco once and I was up there with my friend David in uh, Chinatown and we we're going to the different, uh, you know, herbal shops up there. There were just like these bins and barrels full of, of herbs and different things. And it was easy to question the quality. Like this stuff couldn't be good if it's in this amount, you know, this bulk amount. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, there's, that, that's always, it's always a question when, when you're dealing with these kinds of, you know, markets and suppliers and things, uh, really making sure that the, the quality and purity is there. Right. Um, last question, what are the best herbs for the liver? Number one herb I would recommend for liver and especially for anybody coming off dealing with a, a history of drugs or alcohol is schizandra berry. So this is a very gentle yet very effective liver cleanser and supportive herb of liver health in general. Um, schizandra, and you know, even if you don't take it for the liver benefits, take it for the beauty benefits, be superficial, it's okay. You'll get other benefits from it too along the way. But yeah, schizandra, it is a great liver cleanser that doesn't have a lot of side effects that you're gonna encounter with many other liver cleansing herbs. And it tastes great to me. I mean, I could just take spoonfuls of that stuff. It tastes delicious. Absolutely. That's like you put it on. That is one that is amazing. It's a, in, in a way an interesting coffee alternative as well, because that hits your tongue and it just like it, it opens up your brain in a way. It like brightens and opens up your eyes. I feel it just like turns you into this positive, energetic, alive and aware mode. And that's just incredible. Do you make a, a little tonic uh, herbal drink for yourself when you wake up instead of coffee? Some days, yes. Some days, no. Um, I, I usually start with just water in the morning. Um, and sometimes I'll do, I'll consume herbs in the morning. Sometimes I'll do it in the afternoon. I like to mix it up a little bit. But the, the, the drinks I make for myself will often fluctuate in their ingredients depending on what's going on in my, my life, what, what feels like the priority, um, how much stress am I under, what kind of physical activities am I doing? You know, I, I'm, I'm a surfer, which is kind of a transient sport because sometimes there's waves and sometimes not. You know, uh, th this winter, there was n not a lot of waves for a long time. So uh, I wasn't having to worry about that in terms of how am I taking care of my body. But recently there was like, a, we call it a, a, a surf bender or like a swell bender for like a, a week surfing every single day. And, and you really got to be active about promoting your, your, your physical health in those times because you're just pushing, 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 pushing all day long. I'm a scuba diver, so I, I don't have that issue. The conditions are always good. So I'm going oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this was really great, Sage. Appreciate you you coming on. And uh, let's talk for a minute about your your products, uh, um, like spe specifically the other products besides the chocolate. Like I noticed you have uh, matcha elixir blends, chai elixir, cacao elixir, and caramel elixir. What are those about? Yeah, so uh, on, on a part of my journey, I in the old days of the Air One Tonic Bar, I, I worked at the Air One Tonic Bar when when it was it was different than it is now. You know, they're they're obviously big and affecting lots of people now in a beneficial way, but it used to be this like core community and cool gathering place where you would come and kind of have like this mini five minute consultation with somebody who was very knowledgeable about the tonic herbs and have something custom crafted to you based on your needs. And 
they, it would be something that was presented in a way that would taste like surely it must be bad for you. It was so delicious and would open people up to these herbs who would normally never try something like this. And so I wanted a way for more people to experience that because I could put out recipe videos all day long, but there, it's only a, a certain percentage of people who will actually go online, look at a recipe video, order the individual ingredients, take the time to you know actually make it. I wanted it to be foolproof, totally user-friendly. And so I created a way that it's all in a powder, basically. And you're just blending it with a cup of hot or cold almond milk or coconut milk or, you know, A2 dairy milk, that's your thing. And it, it the, the, the creaminess, the, the sweetness, the herbal ingredients, the delicious flavors, it's all already happening in there. So for, especially for somebody on the go, it, it is really optimized for that. And then for people who want to get into more precise adjusting of things to their, their individual needs, we also sell a lot of these herbs as very potent individual herbal extracts um, for people to, to have fun with. Awesome. So is the matcha one at the, the one with the most caffeine out of the four? Correct. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I think matcha is 47 milligrams. That, that's just off memory. I, I, I could be off, but it's on the label. Um, and it's on our website, the, the exact milligrams of the caffeine. But yeah, that's that's the more caffeinated one. And formulating that one, man, I had to take the littlest sips only because I'm so sensitive with this stuff. I had to take, okay, a little sip and and then like have, you know, five other people taste it and give me feedback. Uh, but we we nailed it in a way that that people have really enjoyed, which I'm, I'm very excited about. That's awesome. And w- one thing we didn't mention is uh, your chocolate is uh, mold tested, right? Yeah, so in, in the world of chocolate, one of the, the huge dark secret is that most cacao products have real problems with mycotoxins. And these are basically mold byproducts that people are sensitive to in varying degrees, but there is nobody who benefits from consuming mycotoxins. And one of the pretty rare things about our cacao is that it's actually third party tested to be completely mycotoxin free. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Well, uh, addictivewellness.com. Sage, thanks so much. This was awesome. Matt, thank you for having me. It's, it's a, a true pleasure. I'm so glad we did this and it's great to see you. It was a lot of fun. Stick around as we close out the show. That wraps up today's show. I'm surprised that I never heard that chocolate actually contains caffeine. I'd always heard over the years that it contains theobromine and not caffeine. So I was kind of shocked to hear that, but relieved to hear during my caffeine break, whether it is temporary or lasts forever, that there's only 13 milligrams of caffeine per tablespoon of cacao. I also liked that Sage brought up the COMT gene mutation, where you metabolize caffeine slower, therefore you are more sensitive to it. I definitely feel that. And I didn't take many breaks over the last couple of years, so I'm just on a break. I'm about a week or so into zero caffeine and just taking a ton of adaptogenic herbs to support my my jing, my kidneys, my adrenals, and I just feel really incredible. And that's even with eating addictive wellness chocolates, which have some caffeine, but Like you said, it doesn't hit the nervous system in the same way that an espresso shot would. So check them out. It's addictivewellness.com. Use the discount code Matt Blackburn and you'll save 10%. As I told Sage, my favorite one is the recharge formula, but the tranquility is really growing on me. So I've been eating that one more lately. It's a blend of ashwagandha, reishi, and Hoshu Wu, really powerful herbs. You can find other products that I recommend on my website, matt-blackburn.com. I have my CLF protocol up top if you want to read my philosophy about human health and the solutions, the problems that we face. And if you click on shop, you can see all of the products that I've used over the years. I just added the Garden Tower 2 which is an awesome setup, especially if someone has limited space to grow a ton of herbs. I love cilantro on my tacos at home. I love eating salads. 
I think these foods have benefits. There's powerful phytonutrients in there. There's valuable fiber, and they just taste really good. Who doesn't like a tuna salad? That's one of our favorite instant meals. Been enjoying the safe catch tuna, some high quality garlic sauce, Cassandrinos olive oil, apple cider vinegar, some sea salt in a bed of red leaf lettuce that I always ozonate. That's the way I clean my herbs and vegetables. My brand is Mitolife. You can find that at mitolife.co. We're actually having a Father's Day sale through the weekend. So until the 18th, you save 20% off automatically everything on the website. So if you've been waiting to try the products, now is the time. Try one of each. Try the ones that you're drawn to. I used to hang out in the supplement section of health food stores for many years. And before I created anything, I wanted to make sure it was something different and a brand that really emphasizes the basics. Vitamin C, magnesium, vitamin K2, vitamin E, enzymes, digestive, systemic, powerhouses of nutrition like beef liver, oyster, elk velvet antler, and recently jellyfish collagen. A lot of people are skeptical nowadays of supplements and say, just eat real food, just get it from food. But when you look at the popularity of these deleterious chronic health conditions that people are suffering from, you start to question whether that just eat real food mantra is doing people good. And in my opinion, it's not a good message because we do need additional support to come back from decades of deficiency. That's what I did for myself years ago when I realized that I was raised basically eating slop, you know, just standard American diet for at least 20 years or more. You start to look into what these simple nutrients, seemingly simple, like zinc, vitamin C, vitamin E, and K2, you see into the effects that all of these have. And then you look at symptoms that you've dealt with. I did this myself and noticed a direct connection with the symptoms I was having in the nutrient deficiency, whether it's magnesium and memory recall or vitamin K2 deficiency and dental cavities. You start to make these connections and these become a lot more than supplements. They become tools that are really helpful in your journey to coming back to balance. So I really appreciate all of you that have supported my life over the years. I really put my whole being into this and it's really important to me to share this message. Last thing, check out the Mitolife Academy on YouTube. It's $15 a month and you get two private videos and then a live Q&A the last day of the month where you can ask me anything, recent experiments, revelations, things that I'm researching. That is a wrap. I'll see you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged. Mm -hmm.